Awesome to welcome Overtime Elite's Dave Lato to the Basketball Podcast. Dave Lato is an accomplished American professional basketball coach currently holding the position of head coach for the City Reapers and Overtime Elite. With a coaching journey spanning various institutions, including DePaul University, University of Virginia, and his alma mater, Northeastern University, Lato has left an indelible mark on the basketball world. Lato began his coaching career as an assistant under Jim Calhoun at Northeastern University, later joining Calhoun at the University of Connecticut. After a stint as the head coach at Northeastern, Lato returned to Calhoun's staff during the Huskies' national championship winning season in 1999. In 2002, Lato assumed the head coaching position at DePaul University, leading the Blue Demons to postseason appearances including the NIT in 2003 and 2005, as well as the NCAA tournament in 2004. Taking over as head coach at the University of Virginia, Lato made history as the first person of African descent to coach any varsity sport in Virginia Cavaliers history. Notably, he was named the Atlantic Coast Conference Coach of the Year by the Associated Press in 2006-07 season. Continuing his journey in the innovative overtime elite league, Lato has achieved success winning the OTA finals in the league's first two seasons. David, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. I'm so happy to be with you. Yeah, a lot of fun. I mean, I, certainly I've known about you forever. You've been involved in so many levels of basketball and so much success. And now in this OTE experience, which we're going to dive into, which is wonderful. I, I'll start with this, actually. Coach, 15 years ago, neither of our jobs existed. Me running a podcast, me running an online brand, and now you coaching a professional team designed for high schoolers to be able to develop into professional players. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that part of it first? Yeah. So, you know, what we have in modern day society is a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity. And I think the owners, Zach Wiener and, and Dan Porter, who were not in the basketball space, looked at the sport and knew that, hey, the pathway to get to success, professional basketball, whatever it brings about, family, financial, was only to go from high school to college, college professional sports. What if we try it a different way? And a little bit of the European model was, was talked about, uh, Tony Parker and what he has in, in his academy over in France. And so that's where the idea and the creativity came from. We could recreate something like that here in the United States. So a few years ago, uh, when the thought, you know, tried to become a reality is, OK, how can we formulate it? And so that's how OTE was born through those conversations and gathering that up, putting it together, the people, the place, the things, the financial backing, the investment necessary was all part of putting something like this together that took, you know, two or three years to formulate. And, you know, here, here we started three years ago and, and then ultimately here we are today. And two straight championships for you. And uh, we'll get yeah, into that yeah. part as well and talk about uh, mm -hmm. some of the connections between college and player development for you in particular. But mm -hmm. uh, I also want to talk about another in advancement that you're involved in, and that's ABIS, mm -hmm. Advancement mm -hmm. of Black in, Blacks in Sports. Can you talk to mm -hmm. us about that and the mission of that? Yeah, it's a really, really keen and, and emotional endeavor, you know, born out of the uh, murder of George Floyd as it turned the world upside down. You know, I live and have lived in the athletic space, the basketball space, the majority of my my life. But I was deep into the BCA Black Coach Association and in its inception in 1987, 1988 and became president. So it's meant a lot to me to serve coaches, especially those who are underserved and, and understand, you know, that their voice should matter and their trek through this industry is not necessarily an easy one. And so when that when that George Floyd murder happened, you know, some colleagues, my Gary Charles, who's been a good friend of mine for 30 plus years, and some other people, Leonard Hamilton, people like that, that were that were involved in, in our sport, started communicating quite regularly. Obviously, we we're involved at the time during COVID. So there was a lot of people with time on their hands. What can we do? What should we do? Obviously, on the scope of the totality of uh, what was going on in the country and in, 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 uh, in the world throughout our international community, we couldn't affect it as much, but in our basketball community, we could. So we started having communication and conversation and, and one thing led to another. We were able to gather some of the greats, not just in basketball, but are around the country and have them interested in our sport and what can we do, both men and women. And so it formulated from there 
or we've been able to over a short period of time affect so many things. I think we changed the narrative on hiring of black coaches at all levels, both professionally, collegiately, and otherwise grassroots. We've been able to take care of our youth. We have a financial coaching uh, arm to what we do that is taught our, our youth on a collegiate level what to do uh, with the finances that hopefully you'll make one day. Uh, we're in the mental health space and just uplifting Black people and Black coaches in the sports world that we uh, tend to see and interact with every single day. So it's been a wonderful endeavor. Uh, we, we're coming up on All-Star Weekend. We have some meetings that are critical to our future, some fundraising efforts that will allow us to do a lot more than we are currently doing. So uh, I maintain myself in that space because it's been beneficial to me, to those around me, and will continue to be moving forward. Just tremendous stuff. And the website for coaches to check out is we are a B I S dot O R G and uh, please go check it out coaches. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll come back to that and a lot of the other things that you're involved in, in terms of advancement, but getting into the basketball part a little bit, and I know this is a broad question, but I'd love to hear your perspective mm -hmm. on it is how has your approach to player development particularly evolved from your time as an NCAA division one coach to now coaching overtime elite? Yeah, so I think one of the things that I've been blessed with is to have great mentorship. You know, uh, I played and coached with Jim Calhoun, who has been a great mentor of mine on how you go about living your life, not just as an athlete or as a coach. Some of my other coaches that I've had in my life, some people that have meant a lot to me, showed me uh, what early on in my career that if you looked at me and you define me as your coach, then I've done a really poor job of representing myself. You have to be so much more. So in this space that I'm in right now, I get to exemplify that in a lot of different ways. You know, we, we are a primarily skill development oriented business. So when you come here as a athlete, you have an advantage that few, if no other people in America have that you're going to get better and teach and get taught by and coached by those who are experts in the field of getting uh, athletes better in their craft kind of like an IMG started out for tennis and Nick Bolletieri. So that is at the forefront of what we do. But behind that, there's so many things that go into being a supreme level athlete and ultimately a supreme level person. Because when you leave here and go out into the world, not just the world of athletics, uh, whether it be professionally, collegiate or otherwise, you've got to understand emotionally and through your thought process who you are, uh, how you fit in, and what is going to make you successful. And so uh, for me personally, I've taken all of the experiences I've had on the collegiate level, uh, not just on the sidelines of what you have to do and teach in a one-on-one -on -one situation or a five-on-five -on -five situation, uh, but how you mature, which is what teenagers all have to do in my own home and I'm sure everybody else's home, how you help them mature and get ready for the world. And so we have a lot of things that we do here at OTE that, that would emphasize a lot of those things other than the specifics of basketball, which I think we do a really, really good job at. Well, and that shone through in the documentary, which we talked about a little bit before we started, which I think was a tremendous peek inside what you guys do there. And particularly that OTE emphasizes a holistic approach to player development, including the academic support, the life skills training, the mentorship, and uh, balancing that obviously with the sports sciences and trying to incorporate that. And, you know, it must be pretty similar to you to a certain extent in balancing running a division one program. Yeah, it really is. You know, you you as a leader of a Division One program, and that's part of the challenge to go from an assistant to a head coach. You're involved in so many more things than you know how to handle a lot of times. So you learn on the fly. But you know, leadership comes in a lot of a lot of different ways. And so here you've got to diversify your time with a lot of different ways to help these young men become better at what they do. Sleep patterns. That, we don't talk a lot about that. How do I get the proper eight to nine to 10 hours sleep? What, do, what If I can't go to sleep at night, how do I conquer that? How do I get up on time and get to the places I need to do? Nutritionally, you know, e eating Doritos is, is what these young guys thrive off of. Well, when they get to 25, 20, 78, you know that professionally, when you have enough wherewithal and, and financially have the ability to hire a chef, they're going to treat you a certain way so that your body becomes your temple. Well, at 16, 17, you have no idea, but those things become critical to our uh, our advancement of, of, of our young guys every day. We live in a world of analytics, you know, and data 
And so what does that mean on how I go about my workout and what am I looking for? What do I have to do? Reading the game of basketball, having it slow down. And so I see it in a different way than I ever have. I think one of our biggest challenges is that you come from a place where you were a superstar. That's why you're here because you, your talent has brought you to this point. We have currently 32 of some of the best basketball players in the country. That means that you've got to share and you don't get as many shots or opportunities as you used to. What does that mean? Because when I go from here to college or professional basketball, I may not be that person on that team that gets to take all the shots and makes all the decision and dribble all the basketballs. I may be a three and D player. So a lot of those things go into the diversification that I have to have and we have to have when we're teaching these young men how to become better at, at what they do and how to move forward. I mean, there's so many places to go with this conversation. You mentioned analytics. So let's go there first and talk to me about, I mean, I've talked many times on this podcast with people who have mentioned the same thing, that young people are so much more educated about the game because of the way they've consumed the game in these short bursts and through social media and just the general general education of analytics and all the different things that go with it. So in analytic per, from an analytic perspective, what are some of the things that you have to educate players about and then what are some of the best metrics that you've found to be able to help them in their supporting their development? So so what, what I talk about or what we talk about a lot is in, in your workouts, like what, what are you doing and how are you doing it? First is volume, right? And so we have NOAA machines at every basket in our, in our practice facility that track every shot you take, the trajectory, how it makes a shot, how to make a shot, how it misses, all those things that we can track. Not just, hey, I went to the gym and I took 200 shots today. Well, what is what is exactly that doing for you to help you improve? So that's where it kind of starts. And then it kind of goes from there. Uh, am I better going right? Am I better going left? We can track all of those things uh, from an analytical standpoint. We know that in today's game, it's so heavy on a three-point line. And so there are three ways to shoot a three-pointer with my with two feet standing still. What are my percentages? Where are those shots coming from? A corner three versus a wing three. On the move, what are my percentages? How do I approach that shot? How can I get better going right or going left and catching into a shot? Dribble into a three-pointer. So we break all of those things down. We show them graphs. We talk about it individually on where you're at, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, what to go out on the court and work on. And then, you know, dial it down from there, from anywhere from free throw shooting to layup taking, how I take layups, mid-range shot. The game discourages mid-range shots, but if you're going to do that, how do you become a better at it or an expert at it? Shooting, you know, when you're open versus when you when you come. So there's so many things that we take from an on-court experience, and we look at the the data, we look at it on film, so that they can start to understand why I'm on the court as opposed to just being on the court. So a, a lot to obviously unpack for a player. In terms of learning these things and figuring out these things and a lot of the places they came from, maybe they've been exposed to it a little bit or not very much at all. So is the educational process a big part of that in terms of educating them about why this stuff is important? Yeah, and, and two things are really, really critical to that. One is the education, as you mentioned, Chris, and, and understanding uh, why this is important, uh, teaching them the, the, the data that they maybe have never even known about or seen prior to coming here. Uh, and then the other part of it is is meeting where they're at. You know, we, we have all this information, but it's only good if you understand it. And so some people learn better than others. Some people accept information better than others. So we've got to dial it down sometimes or dial it up to people that understand, we have to understand, excuse me, where, where they're at in their learning process. And, you know, it, it's only good if they understand it. And so we have to understand from our standpoint as teachers, where to meet them so that they can digest it and then be able to uh, become better at it. So from the outside, looking in at many of these basketball documentaries, mm -hmm. and certainly if I spend any time with you and or any of the college programs I spend time with, I think the part that people who don't coach for a living don't understand mm -hmm. is obviously how rewarding coaching is, but also how exhausting it is, mm -hmm. particularly around <laughs> managing player behavior. And that's not mm -hmm. just your place. Mm -hmm. It's every place in the world that, People don't see that mm -hmm. part of it. Talk to us a little bit mm -hmm. about that process of this pre-care, this aftercare, this continuous care. Yeah. I mean, it really is yeah. a huge yeah. part of the process. 
Well, you, you strike a very uh, critical chord with me, Chris, because I I get really cynical because the coaches, right? And I, I say this, when you go to a game, there's only five people that don't know what the heck they're talking about. Three referees and two coaches. Everybody else is an expert, right? So <laughs> turn that around. I would not walk into a courtroom and tell a lawyer that his objection or her objection is wrong. But I could do that with a coach. So there's a sensitivity to what we do because we're sports. We're recreational and it's called a game. Uh, but it, the nuances of what makes somebody better at it than others is all the things that you just mentioned. I've got to take a young person, understand the physical capabilities that they have, try to improve those physical capabilities so that they can maximize their talent and potential. But then I've got to take this neck up portion of who they are. I've got to dive into that every day. I've got to understand where their learning points are, their emotional capabilities, understand how they receive information, what kind of learner are they? Are they a visual learner? They learn through action or anywhere else that, that they're really good at. I've got to plug myself into that on a day-by-day -day basis. Are you a morning person? Are you an afternoon person? You can learn better at night. How do you accept that? And then I've got to do it with a group. You know, and so I'll take all, let's say, 10 individuals where they're at physically and emotionally, understand that each one is different. And then I've got to get them to sing the same song at the same time. Right? And so when I watch a game on television, hey, why did that guy drive by you? Or how come they didn't get back on D? Or how come I call you and call timeout? Or how come yeah, I would have done this? Yep, yep, yep. It's not rocket science, the game of basketball. Just like we question Nick Saban when he doesn't, you know, go for it on fourth and three uh, when he was a coach at Alabama. But behind the scenes and what we do every single day, as you mentioned, is exhausting work. But it's what we love. You know, being around young people for, for 40 years has been the joy of my lifetime. God has blessed me a thousand times over to be able to be around young people my whole career because I get to morning, afternoon and night be involved with the process of teaching them how to not just be better athletes, but better people and do it in harmony. I love that answer, Coach, and I'm on side with everything you said. And, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, seeing people grow is such a rewarding experience. And I think that's the part of coaching that is just so valuable as you continue in it. And uh, for me, I, I want to ask you a little bit your strategies, not, not necessarily around motivating players, but more about like this continual, continuous process of challenging them to be better mm -hmm. and balancing that with telling them, hey, you're doing the right things and you're doing yeah. well. Yeah. So an, another great question in that, you know, I come from as an 18 year old, I, I met Jim Calhoun and, and he recruited me and he's part of the guard, the old guard of coaches where it was my way or the highway. Right. So you know, Bobby Knight, oh, goodness gracious, he was great coach, but you had to do it Bobby Knight's way, Jim Calhoun. And the list goes on and on. And so that's how I learned the game. That's how I learned how to teach is say, hey, you know, you've got to do it. And you and there's no ifs, ands, and buts. If, in order to be successful, there is no other way. We live in a totally different society than we did back then. And so figuring out how to motivate and how to get young people to do things that, that are beneficial to them is totally different now. And so I learned, I, I had a, a, a mentor, a woman who's one of my favorite people in the world, and, and she said, to everybody, not just me, the greatest gift that you can give to a young person is the gift of confidence. And so in this space that I'm at, how do I give confidence without supplanting the thing that they need, which is strength and discipline and structure and accountability and all those things that I learned uh, that could take your confidence away. And so having that balance is really key here at OTE to, and, and I have a saying, and I, I spoke to a young group on, on Sunday, and I say this to these guys, our, our, our employees and our, our kids every day is, how you doing, right? The typical answer is, I'm doing good. How you doing today, Chris? Oh, Dave, I'm doing good. Well, good is the enemy of great. So how can I get you to be great? Well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy to, to believe it and, and say it and speak it into existence so that if I say it every day, you want some of what I'm eating for breakfast. And so that helps build confidence, self-assurance. You know, these guys are really, really good athletically, and they're at their best when they're on the court. That's when they're at their most confident. But away from basketball, they're seeking confidence in so many other areas, and we have to try to build that same confidence in you as a young person as you try to be on the basketball court. And when you're unsuccessful on the court, 
that you, that means you have a loss of confidence and then that carries over to academics and every other part of your life. So it's a, it's an interesting dynamic that I've tried to give to uh, everybody here every day. Uh, I'm the oldest person here. So by virtue of that, I have the most experience, uh, good and bad. So I try to give them this gift of confidence by how I approach my day so that they can approach their day in a similar fashion. And uh, by the way, about the good part, I, I will never accept them saying good or okay, because I basically mm -hmm. tell them that that's a non-answer. Like right. any right. other detail other than that gives us more information. And that's, right. I'm glad you brought that up. That's, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. You and I both grew up in an era where it was a lot more coaches of do it this way or else. Mm -hmm. And uh, talk to me a little bit about how you've evolved philosophically, mm -hmm. because obviously both of us have had to adjust a little bit from the mentorships mm -hmm. we've got to how... Mm -hmm it's okay to coach nowadays. Yeah. So, so sharing a little bit of a secret, you know, I, I, without even sometimes wanting to or meaning to, I was more like my mentors than I was. You know, so, so if, if things weren't going well, we lost the game. I'm a, I'm a competitor. I don't dial down from that at all for good or for bad. And when, when I, or we, lose i didn't react very well to that i mean i it was a partly cloudy syndrome over my head and people didn't necessarily want to be around me this is a totally different experience and so i might be the most optimistic or sunshine guy in this building and so i, I belong to a men's group and we were talking about that last week and they said well how did you get from dark cloud or partly cloudy to partly sunny every day and i said i got fired twice like, what do you mean that? I, because it, it, it allowed me to see what God was doing to me and for me in a situation where most people would think negative, but it brought me out of a situation to allow me to see the world differently. Right. And, and I spent a lot of my college years trying to figure out how to get the next win, how to make the next basket or how to get the next stop on defense, how I think the people should be treated, all those things. And I made my fair share of mistakes. And I think by and large, people would say, hey, Dave's a good person. But at the same point in time in competition, I didn't always handle that properly. This gives me an opportunity at overtime to, to see things a little bit differently, to act and think differently, and to have the best of me presented, not just to the man in the mirror, but to people that will feed off of me or maybe will listen to anything that I have to, to say. And so that's what's made from uh, this experience for me, the, the experience of a lifetime, because I'm a, a better version of myself. I can take all the core and foundational things that, you know, Jim Calhoun, I've been around, you know, the Big East, Jim Beheim, John Thompson, Roly Massimino, Rick Pitino. I've watched and, and studied those guys and just the sport as well and, and you know, bits and pieces and put it into what I think is, is appropriate. So that foundation is critical. I'm not going to back away from that. But living it in today's world, when I'm in, in – arena with today's youth is really important to balance that and have them benefit from both parts of that. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I think a lot of us can relate to that journey that you've been on. And, you know, again, it shows in the documentary about how you are able to connect and communicate with this generation. And it shows that you've put tremendous work into that. Talk to us a little bit then about player development in the context of how are you helping players understand that what they are doing with you is leading towards improvement, which I'm sure is not just a communication to them. It's a communication right. to the parents, the agents, the different right. people around right. them. But let's right. focus maybe on the player perspective. Yeah, so so understand when you come here as a player, there's a naivety to it. There, as I mentioned before, there's a confidence that you think you are really good. But you know, at, at 17 or 16 years old, you don't understand the definition of an eternal learner. Right. So at our age, we're still learning. We're learning more today than we did at, at our teenage years. But you think sometimes you got this thing figured out. So so when you get here, the skill development, as I said, is like no other. You're going to understand what to do with your talent. The, you know, and I, I break it down in three ways. God gifted you. Now you you can maybe run faster, jump higher, shoot better, dribble more efficiently than those who are in your peer group. That's step one. Step two is learning how to work hard. And so when you step on the court and I say this, I ask each one of them the question, give me the definition of insatiable. What does that mean, coach? I don't understand. Insatiable means I cannot do without it. I cannot function. I cannot live without it. A man and a, a saw Thompson were insatiable, are insatiable workers. They slept in their apartment. They lived in the gym. 
And so that's the first part. How constant are you every day in spite of all the challenge at being present and being here? And everybody says, I want to work hard. What is the definition of that? Am I insatiable about it? Do I work harder and more often than you? That's that's phase two. And phase three is, do I have a, a understanding of my surroundings starting with myself? And we put that into the basketball portion of what we do. So when you're on the court, we're going to try to require that you don't just take a layup just to take a layup. You don't take a jump shot because somebody says shoot around. That's called free swim at, at the municipal pool. You know, when you splash around, when you're working on your craft, you're doing it with intention. And so teaching them that every day is a chore that we you know, have to embark ourselves on. It's not easy uh, because they're not understanding of, of, and that's what Kevin Ali did really, really well. I mean, we're going to get you to work harder than anybody else. And so that part of it lives in this gym to this day. And then the, the challenge, the biggest challenge and the biggest separator is what kind of mindset that you bring into this basketball space every day, right? It's not going to be your best day every day. But if I'm working on your game, we're trying to get you to understand and read, pick and roll and, and make great decision then I need you present emotionally. I need you physically ready to go so that we can take advantage of the talent that God has given you. And when you put all three together now, it gives you an opportunity to grow and get better when you're on the court. Love it. I love it. And for you personally, maybe, what was something that you came in with that maybe surprised you about this mm -hmm. process that you're now involved in? You know, just, just how much uh, information that there is out there to for me to continue to learn and give basketball has an infinite amount of information you know and we all do it after the fact you know if a, if a guy didn't box out he's running down the other end you got to box out well if he knew that beforehand and could do it then you wouldn't have to say it after the fact but but it's hard to cover every single dimension to it and so we become after the fact teachers well what i trying to do is speed that process up and become a prequel teacher as a post action teacher. And we're going to, and now we have every tool available to do that. We have film, we have teachers, we have communication. We have all the things that we've described at the beginning at our disposal, which give you information, hopefully before it happens, knowing that in infinity, you're not going to cover every situation, what to do on a two-on-one -on -one fast break and how to read a defense, all those things that happen in real time. Well, how can we, you know, use a cheat code to get you a little bit more advanced than your peer group? So when you leave here, you, you know, understand and understand physically and mentally because you've, you've been there, done that more often. And what about something that, you know, maybe you've been able to bring to the table that OT necessar didn't necessarily account for, didn't necessarily account for as much? Mm -hmm. Because again, you're bringing tremendous real world experience to this organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I just go back to Chris, my blessings, and I, I could have never imagined the career that I've been able to embark on, the people that I've met, the experiences that I've had, and and the knowledge that comes from it. I, I've always said I, I've never was or ever wanted to be the smartest person in the room, but I think what I'm really good at is common sense. So I try to bring a common sense approach to how I communicate every day. If it makes sense on a very simplistic level, it's probably going to make sense overall. And we get ourselves in emotional and, and verbal tussles about what is and what isn't, what should you do, what shouldn't you do. And I'm like, does it make sense? Like the, the, do the things that we're trying to do or teach make sense, particularly to the people that are listening to us? And if it makes sense, it's probably going to be good. And I think it's, it's a fallacy of society. You know, we get into these tussles, whether it be politically or uh, family-wise or community-wise and things like, whoa, let's take a step back and make it make sense. And if we can use our common sense of things, I think that is part of the definition of intellectual because we can talk about it. We can agree on things at a very simplistic level or we can disagree. You know, let, let the, the critically intelligent personalities figure out how to solve the problems of the world. Let us, you know, lay on the space that we that we live in every day and try to solve the problems that are in front of us and keep it that simple. Well said. If common sense was our guide, the world would be a much better place. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. So we've already talked about a little bit the role of, you know, how coaching has evolved. And and I'm just curious, like, 
from your perspective, what do you see in the future as coaching evolving in terms of helping shape, particularly around the grassroots and the development of young players? Let's let's focus specifically on America, maybe in American basketball, because that seems yeah. to be a lot of people coming out and saying there's some deficiencies in it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yet you're still the best basketball country in the world. So there can't be mm -hmm. as many deficiencies as people think. So yeah, so start. so without without using the reference of of international basketball, I I will use it for a second, right? So yep. in 1992, and this is my own theory, it could be true, it could be not. In 1992 when the dream team embarked upon their Olympic gold, they destroyed the rest of the world to the point of embarrassment, right? So what is Europe, Eastern Europe Asia, what do they do? They go to work on improving their game. They'll never have the athleticism of a Michael Jordan or the, the, the guys that were on that team, but they can teach the game better. So, so what I realized while I was coaching is that there were, there were groups of six or eight or 10 coaches that would come over from Greece, from France, from different European countries, from Eastern Europe, from Serbia. Hey, coach, can we watch your practice for four or five days you could not to this day coach outside of the united states without a coaching certificate right and in, in, in america that's not the case i joke with everybody here if i if i am in a certain community and there's three really good players in my community and i get five other guys i've got a team and i'm a coach <laughs> i don't know the game as well i don't know how to deal with young people very well i don't know how to organize a lot of, but I can call myself a coach. And so what is missing in our culture of basketball around, because we still have phenomenal athletes, we still do really good things, but there's a reason why the, the last five NB, MVPs in the NBA are foreign born is because they've caught up in the teaching aspect. And then we could say fundamentally sound, we could say all those things, but how the game should be played. And if you are as athletic, quick, fast, and, and do things in a hurry, and you can think it equally as well, that's how you become proficient as a player and as a team. And I think that is, even as part of ABIS, to get the uh, ability to teach coaches how to coach, to have a factory where coaches can come in, teach the game, learn how to teach the game, how do you deal with young people, psychologically or otherwise, and become better at your craft so that you're, you're doing it the right way and advancing in a way that makes American basketball stay at the forefront and cutting edge of how great we are uh, in this game. Absolutely. And I'm Canadian. I came up through a coach education system where I needed to go through different steps. And certified doesn't always mean qualified, but it definitely means you've gone through the process. And as you refer to in America, anyone can just step on the court and suddenly you call yourself a coach. So I love how you approach that and how you said that. And the challenges, of course, are in this big country, how are we going to do it? Personally, I'm grateful, Coach, because basketball immersion was created in part because many people didn't understand teaching and learning and skill acquisition and motor learning concepts. Mm -hmm. For example, Marcus Klusman, who works with you, has been a basketball mm -hmm. immersion member and has learned a lot of these things through that vehicle because mm -hmm. coaches haven't learned them. There's no place right. to learn right. them otherwise, right? right. So right. Right. how do we inspire the next generation of coaches, per se, to yeah. be self-driven in their learning, to be able to learn these things and connect these things, because it's not coming from administrative mandate, is it? Right, right. And so uh, I think the first thing is to realize where you're at, you know, and, and when you do that, you have to understand we've got to take a step back and realize, yes, we're good at this, but we can certainly be so much better. And when you come to that realization, you leave your ego aside and say, okay, well, how can I grow and how can I get better? And now what we're talking about is not just a coach or a person. We're talking about masses. We're talking about communities. We're talking about states. We're talking about regions of the country that all could use this benefit. So that is a huge, huge endeavor. I'm not so sure that, that I can handle that as an individual, but a concept grown out of communication can develop into anything you want it to. And so it's my hope that if, if this idea has some meaning that we as a country can look at it at the grassroots level, those who coach youth basketball, those who coach AAU or grassroots basketball, those who coach high school basketball can do it in a way where they become students of it. And we have enough coaches around this country 
whether they have the time or paid for their time or are ex-coaches or whatever the case may be, to invest in this process of teaching the game the right way. And the game starts with, yes, how do I do it in between those four lines? But it goes so far beyond of how do I teach young people understanding of respect, communication, all those things, that, teamwork, all those things that are part of basketball that can help them be better people as well as better athletes. And, and then you can start to call yourself or understand the definition of, of what it means to be a basketball coach. I'm so on board with this. And thanks for having this conversation because I do think another part, which you kind of hit on a little bit, and I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on that. The hard part about coaching is not deciding the X's and O's and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It is holding people and players accountable to what you want them to do or what they need to do to be successful. And that's mm -hmm. really hard. And traditionally it used to be this yelling approach and this, mm -hmm. you know, carrot and stick approach. And now that's not the way. So talk to mm -hmm. us a little bit of that process of holding players accountable to what you need them to do to help them be successful. A few years ago, uh, I, I was put in contact with, with a gentleman, Dr. Joe Carr, and, and uh, he goes around individually with professionals and collegiates. He does teams, does it internationally. He has this approach to sugar and hot sauce, right? And so sometimes it was hot sauce. I've got to sting you and, and make you feel how heat, how, how hot that, that food is to, to teach you. And then sometimes I got to use sugar. I got to put my arm around you, make you feel. So, and, and here I, I talk about it OT. I can't ask a young person, whether they work here or they play here, to trust me without a defined relationship trust is a very very hard world to hard word to to wrap your arms around yes i trust my wife been married for over 33 years so she trusts me i trust her in a three-month relationship can i use that same word and say that you trust me and everything that i say but what we can do is use that word rely on right you can rely on me if you understand that I have your best interest at heart. And that goes from coach to player, uh, employee to employee. So if I have a young person and I and, and what I'm telling them about themselves, whether I use sugar or hot sauce and, and the times where they don't feel good or they don't necessarily understand or want to accept what you say, but you know that I have your best interest at heart, then you can rely on me. And I, and, and I know that you are bought into this process. That means I can rely on you. So when you don't do things well, or there's a hiccup, or you're missing something, or you oversleep, or all the things that happen to young people, then we can go back to that avenue by which we rely on each other to continue to grow in our relationship. And when you grow in that relationship, eventually, and hopefully, you get to the point where you can start understanding the definition of trust. And if I trust you all, I'm going to run for, through a wall for you. Uh, but I can't get there unless I'm invested in this process of understanding some days I'm going to put my arm around you and show you great love. Other days, I'm going to challenge you with a little hot sauce on your tongue to know that, you know, you can't put your hand on the uh, on the stove like that without having some consequences. And so those are the things that I try to understand about myself as I teach these young guys. And I try to get everybody around here who's involved. And it was not just coaches, it's coaches, it's skill development, it's, it's learning facilitators, it's nutritionists, it's skill development people. Uh, as I said, it's data analytics people that all are involved in this process of understanding how best to maximize the potential for these young guys. Well, you mentioned that. I mean, by the way, I love your connection between your wife and your relationship versus a three to six month <laughs> relationship with a player. It's totally different. I agreed. hundred yeah. percent. I love it. But you mentioned kind of staff sizes, which is obviously mm -hmm. something that's grown significantly since you started coaching, you know, from two assistants to many assistants to many support staff and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about that process of managing all those different people involved in a player's life. Yeah, that's a, it's really, you know, it's something that I take at heart because as I say here, I, I'm not so sure when you come to OTE, you're looking at it, you know, where am I going to be in 25 years? When I think about retirement, my 401k, you know, but my rocking chair, you come here as a young person, maybe 22, 23 to, to 35 years old, where you're trying to figure yourself out personally, but you're more importantly trying to figure your career out. And so you go through all the highs and lows that the same young people you teach go through about who am I? What am I in this space? How do I excel? And, and so I try to understand that. There's a lot of individual 
communication and conversation that are ongoing, both in my office or out to lunch or on the court about who are you? You know, why are you here? How can you maximize yourself? How can you, what is your next step? Where do you want to see yourself in five years? If you don't know, you know, where can that get you? And, and usually if you see somebody who's doing a good job in one space, then you can assume they're going to do a good job in the next space that they grow into. And that's how you understand advancement. Some people, and, and, and not to you know, talk down about people of the day, they, they're more worried about what they get paid or how many hours they have to work or what they've got to do and all those kind of things, which are counterproductive to the journey. And the journey is, hey, I want one longevity, right? I want to be doing what I love to do, teaching basketball at the highest level that I can attain because I love doing it. I love being around young people. And if you're doing that that way, then you're more able to accept the the, the challenges that are in your way week by week month by month but um don't let those challenges become part of the defining moments that bring you to work every day you know come with a kindred spirit to be able to serve that's what teaching is about that's what teachers do every day in a classroom they serve we are here to serve and if you have a servant attitude then what will come back to you will be tenfold uh, and so trying to get them to understand that uh, and, and the minutiae of what they go through every day, paying bills, trying to have a family at some point, moving to different parts of the country, not knowing if I'm doing a good job or not. Does my boss think that I, all those things go into uh, the confusion of the moment, but do it with some clarity because you're here to serve. And when you do that, people will notice and you'll find yourself in better places along the way. Well, you're putting so many joys and challenges of coaching in really great words, coach. Thank you for that. And you kind of mentioned kind of going hand in hand with this. You mentioned the Thompsons, for example, and of course, all coaches face this on a roster where you have some players that are here, up here, and then you have some players that aren't up there yet. And balancing that and keeping it in perspective for those different types of players while meeting the demands of the best players is a real challenge, isn't it? Yeah, especially here, because all 32 want to be and have been, you know, quote unquote, the man. And so I, I've said this this morning, if if I were to take the three teams that we have here in house and have a meeting individually with each team, I, OK, who's the best player on the team? I get about five hands. Like I'm the best. Player. Well, in any team situation, we know with the Kansas City Chiefs, the quarterback is the best player. Right? He doesn't get the same notoriety as the offensive lineman, but both are critically important to winning. You know, the guy that sets the screen, the guy that comes off the bench, the biggest cheerleader on the sidelines, all those things go into winning. They all go into this part of it. But you come here with the understanding that skill development is part of how you grow as a basketball player. And if I'm really good and I'm invested in skill development, then I'm going to be that much better. Well, when we put it all together and, and start to play games, you know, there's defining who is and who isn't. Not everybody's going to, you know, we we play 36 minute games. If I've got 10 guys, I'm not going to play 10 guys, 18 minutes a piece. That's not going to happen. So somebody's going to get more and somebody's going to get less. Why is that the case? It's the case because your contribution for that day has to be defined in this space. And it's different from the next guy. And it's a hard pill for them. That's, that's probably one of our biggest challenges, if not our biggest challenge, is getting them to understand. Because what happens when we go upstairs to our show court and we play games, the people that view them, the people that they're closer to sometimes are the people that see that they got 15 minutes and three shots. So this process is not working. They don't see what goes on you know, in the dark days of what we do every day and the work that goes into getting them better both physically and emotionally. So that is our, our biggest challenge to understand role definition, not just as a teammate, but in this space that we live in. Particularly thinking around that for us as coaches that obviously we all have to communicate with parents, but you're to another level of communicating with parents. But do you have any advice for us in, in terms of different methods or ways that you've had that have succeeded in communicating to parents to help, again, them Keep it in perspective that it is a long-term process and not a one-day process. My, my son, I have three sons. My middle son played college football at a high level at the University of Texas. And I go back to like it was yesterday. He was playing Pop Warner football. We were living in Virginia at the time. We were in Virginia Beach and parents were sitting around watching practice one day. And 
uh, one of the dads is uh, saying, you know, this is great that we want something better for our children. You know, every parent wants to give their child a better gift than they were afforded when they were at that age. And so it's like, we want to give our children a better life than we had. Yeah, yeah, we really do. But we forget to give them the one thing that they need the most. So what, what is that? What is that? One word, struggle. You know, you, you, you've had it, I've had it, we've all. And so teaching them what it means to overcome the inability to get through a challenging situation is I think one of the biggest keys to life. You know, again, I go back to, you know, we talk about coaches of a generation ago. Well, parents of a generation ago, they, you know, my mom, she raised me hard, you know, and so it was, hey, we're going to do it this way or not. And if you don't like it, too, too, tough luck. If, you, if you're struggling, if you got, guess what, get up tomorrow and do the same thing all the and now you know no disrespect we have gentle parenting and we have these things that don't allow them and we protect them from their ability to to be uncomfortable and finding comfort and discomfort is a requirement of success and so here in this space you know we purposely will, will have that as a part of it to see your reaction and then we'll help you get through that but we cannot in this lifetime provide you an opportunity that you're going to go through this journey, basketball or otherwise, without discomfort and without struggle. And I think that's a big part of the challenges of it that I and we have here at OTE. OTE. And as, it's, as, a, as father, a father, as a parent, as a, parent, uh, as a, community, uh, as a community person, person we, we, live we live that live same, that same journey, journey as well. As coaches, and coach, you've shared a lot of philosophy, a lot of education-based understanding of coaching and the process. Uh, but a lot of it comes back to a foundation. Talk to us a little bit about your foundation. So, you know, I, I, I have a lot of feelings, thoughts, ideas, and beliefs, uh, but I think it's centered around uh, spirituality. My, my understanding that a devotion to your spirit is very, very critical because we don't control the things that we think that we can control. Now, that could be defined in so many different ways. I grew up in a Catholic household, and so Jesus Christ has meant a lot to me. And my best friend in life is, is spiritually sound. I have two that believe the same system that I came to understand in Catholicism is, is a righteous. What My brother is Muslim, and his pathway is different. Both are sound in their spiritual approach to living every single day. They just do it in a, you know, in a different belief system. And so I'm not here to say you're right or you're wrong about who you, but, but I am here to say that the foundation of how you live your life is based on a spiritual belief that there's a higher power than you that controls yourself and it control those around you. And so I think it's really critical to implement that in your everyday life, to, to be appreciative of, you, of why and how you have a successful family, why you're able to do what you do. I, I could give you a long list of things that, that would have gotten in my way uh, when I was a teenager, when I was in my early 20s, that would not have got me to this stage in my life right now. But somewhere along the line, uh, there was a there was a a higher power that had control over my decision making that I couldn't do myself. And so that's why I'm so humble and so appreciative of the things that I've been able to attain and the information that I've gathered to be able to give to people that are younger than I or don't have the same experiences because it's been based on a foundation of spiritual beliefs. Well, your humility and your passion shine through in this uh, interview, and I'm sure in every moment of your life, Coach, and I, I can't thank you enough. I mean, you talk about mentorship in this this hour you've spent with us. I believe that your communication will help mentor so many coaches with some of the things that you said and put it in phrasing that we can all use. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Oh, Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and, and the platform that you gave me. Thanks, Chris.